Hi, and welcome into Meet Me in the Movies Open Dialogue. This is Thomas Manning. And if you're familiar with our show, you know that most of the time we speak with filmmakers or people who are either in front of or behind the camera. Uh, but this time it's just a little bit different. I'm actually speaking with the author of a novel that was adapted into a film, uh, speaking here with Karen Dion, who wrote the book The Marsh King's Daughter, which has been adapted into a film directed by Neil Berger, starring Daisy Ridley and Ben Mendelsohn. Uh, so it was a really interesting conversation with Karen, uh, just talking about you know her writing process and also seeing um, her work adapted and what that you know feels like for her as a storyteller. And uh, she also talks about um, what it means to her to you know be in nature and kind of draw some creativity from that and how that's reflected in the stories she tells as well. Uh, so yeah, just a really interesting. A discussion with Karen and I want to thank her for her time and uh, thank you all for watching and listening as we speak with Karen Dion about the Marsh King's daughter hope you enjoy definitely well you know along those lines uh, I'd love to talk to you about some of your earlier memories uh, about the time when you were first approached about this project and you know, the potential of a studio adapting your book into a film um, what do you remember about those early conversations yeah, that's actually a, a kind of a funny story because when my literary agent sent the manuscript for The Marsh King's Daughter around to editors to see if anyone wanted to publish the book as a novel, um, he sent me an email and he said, by the way, you also have a film agent. And honestly, my first thought was, I guess it could be a movie. <laughs> I didn't think movie for one second as I was writing the book. Some authors I know do, even to the point where they're visualizing a particular actor, you know, to play a, the particular character that they're writing. But I was writing a book. And so I, yeah, that was really interesting. Then it was about a year later that Anonymous Content optioned the film rights for The Marsh King's Daughter. And it was with the screenwriter for The Revenant attached to adapt my book to, to a screenplay. So, you know, when people ask me, did I have anything to do with the script? I, I think those two um, factors will explain why the answer is no. <laughs> I didn't even picture the book as a movie, whereas we have this co-writer of the screenplay of The Revenant adapting the book. So I was more than happy to hand things off to him. But that was in, um, yeah, that was six years ago that it was first option. So it takes a little while for things to come about. And uh, I know the physical setting and the locations are an especially crucial element of this story. Um, so what did you appreciate about seeing these locations visualized and, you know, brought to life in the film and, you know, visualized from your book? Yeah, I think I, of course, I have seen the film and this, the setting is gorgeous. It's like an amplified version of the setting where the book actually takes place. The book uh, takes place and the movie in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness. And I lived there for 30 years, starting in the 1970s when my husband and I homesteaded. So, it, you know, the story is about a family that lives entirely off the grid. Obviously, I drew on some of those experiences to write the novel. And so because the setting was such a big part of the book, it was very important that they get it right in the movie, too. And the uh, president of Black Bear Pictures promised me that they would find settings that look very much like the Upper Peninsula. And they have. I can put a picture, one of my, my pictures and one of their photos side by side, and you wouldn't know which was which. It's really beautiful. And did you get a chance to spend any time on set or visit the set at all? I did not. And I'll admit that was a disappointment because there is no reason for an author to be on set, but it's usually extended as a courtesy. And a number of my author friends, you know, have visited the set where their movie takes place. Well, I live in Michigan. The filming was took place in the summer of 2021 in Canada. And at that time, Canada had COVID restrictions in place that meant a two week quarantine for even vaccinated US residents. And you had to be like somehow an essential worker, which I was not. So no, I wasn't able to visit the set. And uh, that was a little bit of a disappointment. Okay, it was a big disappointment, but <laughs> I just kept telling myself the movie got made because you remember those days, movies were getting canceled because yeah. you know actors were coming down with, with COVID. So uh, yeah, I, I had to just tell myself it's okay. It's a movie. Yeah, definitely. And 
for you as an author, I imagine it's a pretty special experience for you to see these characters that you created uh, in, embodied by some of the greatest actors working today. So when you think back to your original development of this narrative and these characters, how has your relationship with these characters evolved You know, up to this point now that you see them uh, in cinematic form? Yeah, the, the Marsh King's Daughter is a very special book for me. It was my fourth published novel, but it was a deviation from what I had been writing previously. My early books were science-based thrillers, similar to what Michael Crichton wrote. So stories set in the present day, but with a heavy dose of science with them. And to write those books, I started with the plot. You know, what would happen if such and such and such was the situation? Well, for The Marsh King's Daughter, I actually woke up in the night with a first sentence sentences of the novel fully formed in my head. I wasn't dreaming about the character, the sentences were just there. And the sentences are, if I told you my mother's name, you'd recognize it right away. My mother was famous, though she never wanted to be. Hers wasn't the kind of fame anyone would wish for. J.C. Dugard, Amanda Berry, Elizabeth Smart, that kind of thing, though my mother was none of them. So I thought, well, this is interesting. So this character is the daughter of a kidnapped victim and the man who took her. And then, as you know, I, I set the novel in um, a place that I knew well in the Upper Peninsula. So it was a, it turned out to be a very easy book to write because Helena really is me. <laughs> if I was, you know, athletic and <laughs> could hunt and fish and do all the things that, that you know, she's required. So um I didn't have any particular visual in mind for who might play her in the movie. And indeed there were other actresses attached to the project before um, Daisy Ridley came on board. But now that I've seen Daisy in the role, oh, she just couldn't be more perfect. You know, she's got the athleticism to pull off, you know, the, the running through the, through the woods and, you know, the physical things that the, the film requires of her, but her expression and, and the nuance and the subtlety she brings to the character are just perfect because Helena is a very complicated character. Um, those who watch the movie will see this depicted on the screen. Um, as she's growing up, she has no idea that there's anything wrong with her life. Uh, she only sees her mother and father. It's a very weird upbringing, but it's all she knows. And she adores her father. And then later she finds out that he's a bad man. So like I say, it's a, I think of it as a complicated role. And, and I think, you know, it gives Daisy a, a nice opportunity to really show what she can do. And do you think that was, uh, you know, do you think Daisy's role was the most difficult um, across this film for an actor to nail? Or, you know, do you think everyone had their own, um, you know, complicated aspects to nail? Yeah, I, I agree with your first. I, yeah. I think Daisy's role really, you know, the whole movie hangs on that role because it is, after all, called the Marsh King's daughter. And Brooklyn Prince does a wonderful job of playing the character in the past, but it's a much simpler character because it's a little girl who loves her father, you know, and, and likewise, Ben Mendelsohn, he's awesome. And he, he does such a nice balance of of nice and, and creepy. <laughs> there's there's a moment in the film where he's he's there, he and Daisy are reconnecting, you know, as father and daughter in the present. And he smiles at her and he says, let's go for a walk. And it's so creepy. <laughs> and there shouldn't be anything creepy in that smile or comment. But he's very, very good. Yeah, Ben Mendelsohn, he's one of those actors that anytime he's on screen, you just you just can't look away. You're just completely gravitated with everything that he's putting out there. That's so true. Uh, yeah. And, you know, across the stories you've written, I think audiences may see some of the thematic parallels of these protagonists who are reckoning with their past and, you know, facing down the trauma that uh, is still there and still affecting them. Um, so for you as a storyteller, how has your exploration of these themes throughout your career, I guess, shaped your perspective on these issues? That's a very interesting observation because writers do tend to write to a particular theme. There's something about it that just speaks to them. And I'm fascinated by people who have a less than perfect childhood and get past that, you know, because they're not, they're not. Yes, we're shaped by the way we grow up, but we're not, we don't have to be defined by that. We can make choices as an adult. And it's not easy sometimes to overcome your past and not let it define who you are. But that seems to be the theme. You're you're very observant that I return to in, in most of my fiction. 
And, you know, as far as the filmmaking itself, having Neil Berger as the director uh, to realize this narrative, um, what were some of your you know, most m- most notable aspects about what he brought to the table as a storyteller in uh, adapting your work? Well, I think he's very, very clever in bringing the right version of the story to the screen. I understand that as an author, you know, the film is going to be an adaptation of my work. It's not going to recreate the book. That's That would be absurd. And so I feel like Neil really understands, well, for one thing, the theme that we just talked about, that's what Neil sees the heart of the story as well. And so the complicated push-pull relationship that Helena has with her father, you know, how he shows that, how he gets those performances out of the actor. I really want to meet him one day and to ask him how he did it, because it's amazing to me. It's it's something, it's an art form I'm not very familiar with. I can write a book, but uh, boy, don't ask me to make a movie. <laughs> yeah, and so you've kind of alluded to this, how, um, you know, when someone takes over your your story there, I guess, reinterpreting it in their own way. Um, is that difficult for you to kind of let go of your story in a way? It can be. Um, I know some authors who won't even listen to the audio version of their books because it doesn't sound like what they hear in their head. But I've always told myself that that even when a reader reads a book, they're going to be putting their own interpretation on the story based on their opinions and, and experiences in life. So uh, a work of art, as soon as you put it out there, it's open to interpretation. And with that in mind, I think um, I was very open open to what they might do with the story. I, I did have a conversation with uh, the screenwriter before we signed any paperwork. My literary agent insisted on it. He wanted me to be comfortable with the idea that we were on the, on the same page as far as what the story would be. And um, we were, you know, so we went ahead with it. Um, That said, I will admit the first time I read the script, I was a little bit shocked (laughs) at how many things were not in the script and even some fairly major changes. And I I actually wrote to my literary agent and I said, I guess my book is in there somewhere. (laughs) That was my first impression. But then about six months later, I read the final script. And that time I read it with a clear head just to see what was on the page. And it was my story. It is my story. And as I've seen the movie, there's so many times when I, you know, there's a particular scene or situation or even a piece of dialogue. Of course, I recognize it. And I think, ah, I wrote that. That's pretty cool. (laughs) And uh, as you've also talked about how the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is extremely important and significant to who you are. um, And I know that a lot of the times in um, with your characters and the characters you write, nature itself is, I think, very important to them as well. So I guess what is your relationship uh, between your um, your creative abilities and also just your time in nature? Is there a connection there? Yeah, I, I think there is. Um, as I was a little girl, I grew up in a comfortable middle class city environment, but my parents went camping a lot. And I have very clear memories of just being fascinated with the little pine cones and needles and the caterpillars and all the things having to do with the natural world. And it's still the place that I'm drawn to. And I'm also drawn to very empty, isolated places. Um, My first novel, the science-based thriller, was set in Antarctica. And then the next novel was set at Chaitan Volcano in northern Patagonia, Chile, which is, again, a very remote place. And then after that, I, I moved into setting my books in an area I know well, Michigan's Upper Peninsula, but it's still very empty, very remote. Michigan's Upper Peninsula has 29% of the land area of the state of Michigan and 3% of the population. So that gives you an idea and, you know, lots of wildlife. And I really can't explain why, but that kind of place just speaks to me. If, If you gave me a choice, between living in the city and living on the remote top of a mountain, I think you can probably guess which which place I would choose. Yeah, I'm very much the same way. I'd much prefer to live, you know, in a cabin in the mountains somewhere rather than in a downtown studio apartment. And um, 
And even mountains compared to the beach, I'm much more of a mountain person than the beach. Um, so I live in North Carolina and I live fairly close to the mountains and it's just kind of, kind of my happy place and just somewhere that just, I really find that peace of mind. I agree. And, and I think, you know, people really need to spend time in nature. They, yeah. they do, they might, you know, maybe they don't have the opportunity, but it's so restorative. It really is. It truly is. Well, uh, Karen, it was once again a pleasure to speak with you today, and I do appreciate your time and uh, everything you shared about the Marsh King's daughter. And congrats on uh, you know seeing seeing this realized, and um, you know looking forward to um, seeing um, seeing what everybody else feels about it. So, yeah, so am I. And thanks so much for your conversation today. Of course. Well, I hope you have a great day, and uh, it was great to meet you. Mm-hmm.